how much of this stuff was speeded up at least by people like George Soros, people uh, sort of left wing ideologues who, who who believe in open borders and uh, helping out, encouraging yes. more refugees to come. Huge amount. And I say this carefully because there are people who, as it were, go nuts on the Soros thing and, and attribute him to sort of like the modern Rothschild blaming. You know, I mean, there's a there's an unpleasant tinge in the air sometimes around Soros. But if you look at what he and his NGOs did during the crisis of 2015, it was a wicked, wicked thing. And the, the fact that Viktor Orban in Hungary publicly named Soros, he got a huge amount of criticism for this, but he was right, I think. George Soros is meddling in Hungarian affairs that the country's richest and most famous son should have been campaigning to... to I mean, there was a moment when there was exchange in which Viktor Orban blamed, blamed Soros and Soros responded, yes, he is right to identify it because, as Soros said in a statement, that... Orban thinks the refugees are the problem and that the borders are the solution. We think differently. We think that the refugees are the solution and the borders are the problem. Soros's NGOs, and I've seen this on the front lines in the migrant camps, have been over the years helping migrants not just to come into Europe, but to lie when they get here about who they are. Yeah. They're taught via apps and by a, via websites. You can see the websites. Many of them are still up. And by leaflets and other means, they are shown how to beat the system. Not that the system in Europe works very well at all. I mean, the whole system, as I show in the book, was defunct and broken by the time that the 2015 movement happened. But very quickly, this sorry, this, this goes back to a point you, you raised earlier and I didn't actually answer, which is a very interesting and important point about where is different in Europe. And of course, one of the fundamental questions about the migration crisis of 2015 and the, and the period before and since is, why has the East behaved differently? Yes, Poland. Poland, Slovakia, Hungary. If, if, here's, a, here's an interesting one. Viktor Orban, I think everyone would agree, is a right-wing uh, leader, Neighbouring in Slovakia, Robert Fico is a left-wing leader. Now, the Prime Minister of Slovakia and the Prime Minister of Hungary agree absolutely on the migrants question and on the Islam and identity question, despite being right-wing in Hungary, left-wing in Slovakia. Why is this? This is a fascinating subject to me because there are very specific reasons – including the fact that the vast majority of the publics there are totally opposed to the mass migration and support their leaders in opposing it. But another reason I would submit, or another two reasons I would submit, are firstly, that Eastern Europe remembers some of this better. That in the East where armies in the past came in, remember this, remember this thing in particular, and a second reason is that they have something that Western Europeans have lost. I say in the book, it's if you were to boil it down to something, it would be that Eastern Europe still retains the tragic sense of life and that Western Europeans have lost it utterly. We think we've got time off from history. We wish everything away on a tide of human progress. We pretend we don't die. We pretend that the point of life is to acquire more and more things and go on nice holidays. And Eastern Europeans have remembered you don't get time off from history and that you may be swept away from one direction and then swept away from another and you ought to be careful with your society. Freedom isn't free, as Indeed. the Americans would put it. Um, you're listening to Dellingpole, the podcast with me, James Dellingpole, and my very special guest, Douglas Murray, author of many excellent books, the latest being The Strange Death of Europe. <laughs> 